The Battle of the Bulge marked the last German offense on the Western Front. The catastrophic losses on the German side prevented Germany from resisting the advance of Allied forces following the Normandy invasion. Less than four months after the end of the Battle of the Bulge, Germany surrendered to Allied forces. The Battle of the Bulge, so called because the Germans created a bulge around the area of the Ardennes Forest, and I hope I'm saying that name right, pushing through the American defensive line. It was the largest fault battle on the Western Front. It's incredible. Hi, and welcome to mm-hmm. today's Mid-South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler, and we have the very wonderful privilege today to have Diane Height in the studio. And she has a guest. We're going to talk to our guest in just a moment, who actually was there at the Battle of the Bulge. He's got a whole lot more to share, too, today. But, Diane, it is so good to see you. I can't think the last time you were here telling us more amazing stories about our American heroes, which you get the privilege of meeting and have now for how many years? 17. Has it been 17 years yes. ago? That's when we first met, because this yes. was a brand new idea. You were on this show 17 years ago. Your husband and you transferred here to Memphis because he was a pilot with FedEx. Yes. And he retired a couple years ago. Yes. It's so good to have you back and just well, to hear you. what's going on. Thank you. It's been wild. <laughs> I think the last time I was here, we had an Iwo Jima Marine with us. We did. Holland Richardson. Exactly right. And you've brought some wonderful men. Uh, I was thinking about the, the baker over on Highland, Luke uh, McLaurin. Luke McLaurin that was here, McLaurin's Bakery. <laughs> I had his story there is so rich in our city. And just uh, his time there. He's a POW, and he's doing well. Is he still doing well? Yes. Oh, my goodness. i tell you, that is such a wonderful story. And the story, as you mentioned, is repeated so many times. And so many of these stories, these men and women, too, by the way, have gone to their graves and have not even shared some of the heartache and the things they've had to deal with and never really were able to rebuild their lives like some were, you know, because of maybe an alcohol, you know, addiction or broken families or whatever the reason. I know you've seen so many stories. Well, we're here to tell a story today. I'm looking forward to introducing to you Mr. James H. Young. He's soon to be 97 years old. His birthday is coming up in May, I believe. May 4th. Mr. James, you were born back in 1920. From 26, you were born. When you were growing up, where did you grow up? And tell me about family life, your mom and dad, and some of the memories of growing up. I was born on a shanty boat beached at the foot of Beagle Street. My dad was a commercial fisherman. I lived my first years that I can remember was on the Mississippi River living. My earliest recollection, we lived in a tent across the river on the Arkansas side. My dad had picked up a World War I Army surplus tent, and that's my earliest recollection is living on the river. I spent the first 18 years of my life practically working and fishing on the Mississippi River, and my dad also was a, he trapped for fur-bearing animals, so that's how we made most of our living was doing that. So what kind of fish would you pull out of the Mississippi River? Well, the biggest one I ever pulled out of it weighed 87 pounds. It was blue cat. Oh, my catfish. goodness. It was primarily catfish. Yeah. Would be, but then there was a uh, – there, there used to be a, a, a fish in the river. It's, it's no longer there called a spoonbill catfish. They were – sometimes they'd be 25, 30, 40 pounds, something like that. My goodness. But we called a buffalo rough fish – uh, mostly, but mostly we were fishing for catfish. So, would you take these fish to local fish markets, sell oh, yes, them? Yes, there was a fish market on Beale Street, Beale in front. Lipsy's, I believe, was the name of the uh, fish market. There. It was Lipsy's. Matter of fact, somebody just posted in the history of Memphis a picture recently and, and commented on Lipsy's. So, you actually walked in that fish well, market. I actually walked in there and sold fish. <laughs> oh, my there goodness. In there. Yes. How about that? Tell me what was going on in your family life and in, even in the city of Memphis just prior to the war breaking out, what was life like? Well, I lived in, and uh, primarily I lived in South Memphis when we didn't on the river. And uh, I went to school and uh, used, it was the, uh, I went to, hmm, I can't recall the name of that school. Uh, but anyway, it was just kid stuff, playing mostly interested in uh, cowboys and Indians <laughs> and stuff like that, you know. I lived an outdoor life. 
uh, it was I was 13 years old before I ever lived in a house that had electricity. So the entertainment, we had to make our own entertainment. And uh, there was quite a bit of music. There was some gifted people in my family, guitar players and piano players and uh, things like that. So, And we were primarily, um, my mom, uh, we were primarily uh, around the church, right. you know, a local church. And, the the uh, church was an important part of your life oh, growing it, up. It definitely was, yes. Yes, it was. When did you come but, to understand what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross? When did you understand the, the importance of that? That didn't come until later. Of course, I heard a lot of messages and a lot of preaching, and I saw healing and things of that nature growing up. Uh, but uh, I have n- never really had a personal experience with the Lord until I was in a foxhole in Germany during the Battle of the Bulge. Oh, my. My first real experience, and I wrote a little uh, article there uh, that the first time I really had a spiritual experience of the Lord. And it was after the war before I started uh, getting into church. As a matter of fact, uh, when I I was discharged, of course, came back to Memphis, and I met this girl, and uh, two months later we was married. She was a pretty girl. Very. Yeah. <laughs> the most beautiful girl I ever saw, inside as well as out. What was her name? Her name was Louise Louise Davis. She was born in Dyersburg, but she lived in Memphis here. She, I think she was raised in Dyersburg. As a matter of fact, I know she finished high school in Dyersburg. Right. But anyway, she is actually the one that led me to the church. She was talking about the uh, nightmares and all of those things, you know. Uh, no one knows what I went through uh, except my wife at night, and uh, but and it lasted for 17 years. Oh my! And finally, she we got she started a church. My dad passed away, and there was a gentleman preacher preached a funeral, and um, I don't even remember much about the uh, message or anything. But my wife enjoyed. She liked the preacher and, and the message. So and my sister was a member of that church. So they, uh, Louise decided we we're going to start going to church. We had children by that time, and so we started. And that's when I first met the Lord. Uh, and this was after the. Uh, this went was to... after the war had ended. Right. Seventeen years after okay. the war had ended. Okay. But in that foxhole, when I first had the experience with the Lord, I can remember that I, uncon- subconsciously or whatever. I made a, a lot of promises, but when the war ended and I came through it, uh, then I just forgot all forgot all that. Yes. But praise the Lord, He never did forget. Never forgot. The Lord never did forget. Me. Oh. He kept after me until I finally just couldn't go any longer. And uh, one day, though, after we'd started church, uh, we'd been going a couple of a, a month or so, and one Sunday morning. Uh, my wife woke, uh, uh, came, I was sleeping a little bit, bit late. I was still having nightmares and all that. I'd read a book until it, I'd go to sleep and, and the book would fall on my face trying to go to sleep because every time I thought I was closing my eyes, I was going to die and, uh, because death was so close to me from, you know, uh, from the war. And anyway, this one Sunday morning, I wasn't going to go. She said, uh, if you... Uh, you if you'll go with me this morning, well, I won't bother you about it more. She said, why don't you want to go? I said, well, it's it's not doing me any good, you know. And actually it wasn't. I don't don't know why that I wasn't ready or whatever. But anyway, when the service was over that particular Sunday morning, uh, people were leaving the church, leaving and shaking hands. And when I went to shake hands with the pastor, I heard this voice say, um, if you could find time, I'd like for you to come by my house. And uh, he said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I'd like to talk to you. And he said, uh, what about? I said, well, I guess I want, I, need, I want to get saved. And he said, oh, I didn't even know what being saved was, really. And frankly, <laughs> I was listening to a voice from somebody else, I thought. Yes. It didn't even sound like me. So he said, well, why don't we just take care of it right now? And I said, well, all right. He said, well, let's pray. And my answer to him was, 
I don't know how to pray. What I actually meant is I didn't know what to say. Yes. And he said, well, do you repeat, repeat a prayer? I prayed. And I said, well, yes. And so we bowed our heads, closed our eyes, and he said, Lord, I am a sinner. Come into my heart and save my soul. And I didn't say anything. And he repeated it. I still didn't say anything. And I raised my head and opened my eyes, and he was looking at me right in the eye, right like this. And he said, Lord, I'm a sinner. He started praying again. Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. I remember saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. And my friend, something beyond human understanding happened to this person. (laughs) There was no clap of thunder, no lightning bolt, nothing like that, but there was a feeling of peace and tranquility that started just... I believe it started at the end of the hairs on my head, (laughs) and it just started coming down over me. Amen. Like, I I cannot describe the feeling. James, that is so beautiful. The the man, (laughs) uh, the preacher, he... I, I actually realized that he was still praying and so I was repeating the prayer but I want you to know now since I've been studying the word of God and all I know that that was the moment that I became a new creature in Christ Jesus I know that's when Jesus Christ came into my heart and changed my life on the way home I told my wife well she was standing right by the side of me when that happened I said, Louis, something happened to me when Brother, his name was Roy Gingrich. He was a professor at Mid South Bible College. He was one of my professors when I was going to school there. Is I remember, I remember Brother Roy. You yes. remember him? I had some classes, Synoptic Gospels, and well, some, amen. Some other classes I had Brother, with him. He's the one. That, that, <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I said something happened to me. She said, "What?" I said, "I don't know." But I'm either going to have to get in this thing or out of it. And she said, "Well, Jim." Jim Try not to get out of it. Stay yeah. in it. I went home. We went to bed, and this was on a Sunday night. The next morning, of course, I had to go to work. And Louise was shaking me. She said, Jim, you're going to have to get up. You're going to be late for work. I said, what? She said, you're going to be late for work. When I laid down on that bed, I remember laying down on the bed and my head on the pillow but I did not remember nothing else till she was shaking me. Wow. I never had a nightmare. I've never had a mat- nightmare before God. I have never had a nightmare about that war to this very day, to this very instant. Oh. God delivered me from that. Oh, he gee. delivered me from <laughs> using well, yeah. okay. <laughs> bad, yeah. bad words. I was raised on the river. We were tough. I had two... Three brothers and uh, I had cousins that we were just like like brothers of a large family, and we were rough people. And I'm not going to go into that. We didn't, when you know, we were not not thieves or robbers or anything like that. But they were just rugged. Uh, you carried your own. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, James, what a a wonderful testimony of God's goodness and how He opened up. Your heart with his love and his grace and what Christ did is so wonderful, how he took those sins to the cross, and we can all receive that. You know, Diane, this story, I know you get hear, you get to hear this story, too, repeated many times. People who had, you know, been on those battlefields, been in those foxholes, and, and really God met them there. Or, you know, they started seeing, you know, wow, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there is an eternity that, that we have to deal with, right? Definitely. You know, we came not— I don't remember when it was we brought Vince Rao. He was in the second wave of Omaha Beach, and he became a Christian after the war. I can't remember when we brought him here, yeah. but he said to me, I remember that day when we left here, he started crying, and he said, I will not be over the war until Jesus takes me home. Yeah. But the thing about him is he accepted Christ, but he continued to have nightmares. Now, here, isn't this interesting? We've got Jim here who God healed him instantly of nightmares. Yeah. But then we had Vince Rao who continued to have nightmares. And what I learned from that and what the vets have learned is sometimes we don't understand 
why God might deliver one person and not another. Yes. But one thing that we do know is that he is with us no matter what. Amen. Yes. He is with us. Yes. And we can always turn to him for help. Hmm. Well, James, after basic training, you headed to Europe, and you arrived first in Liverpool. Is that correct? England? Whichever side is on the ocean side is where I landed, crossed England and train to the uh, uh, Channel side. Okay. They had already uh, uh, occupied France when I got there. I was a replacement. I joined the second division on the Belgium-French border. And uh, at night about 12 o'clock, and they suited me up with uh, uh, camouflage clothes and snow. Of course, snow was on the ground, and uh, gave me some combat boots and gave me a, uh, a rifle and a couple of bandoliers of, of, of ammunition and a uh, half-pound block of TNT with a five-second fuse to blow a hole, to blow a foxhole, and it, they actually worked. But uh, I joined the second division, uh, B Company, a rifle platoon, and for the f- next couple of three weeks, I was a first scout. And the uh, machine gun section had a um, had a, a mortar shell hit right among them, killed everybody but two, and so I was transferred into the machine gun section, and uh, that's where I said I was a gunner. For throughout the war, thirty caliber air cool. You were in the hedgerow too, weren't you? In France? Yes, we were still in some hedgerows. Yeah, yeah. That and they gave me a clicker to, uh, to you know, to let, to identify myself across the hedgerow. Were you afraid at that point? I mean, I can't imagine being in in a in a battle like that. We moved out for the first time at daylight. All right, I joined. I was assigned to a squad, and a a. a squad leader, a sergeant, and they made me a first scout. So he and I moved out. Of course, the first scout is the first one to contact the enemy to make con- first contact. And we had pu- walked out to, a, uh, it looked like park, part of a barn, one wall out of it, and there was dead horse laying there, and it was swelled very, very big. And we had been talking, and there was a pair of binoculars hanging on a, a post there, and I started picking him up, and he said, don't touch that, it might be a booby trap. And we begin to hear incoming mortar shells. And he said, hit the ground, and I hit the ground. Fortunately, I hit the ground right by the side of that dead horse because our, uh, our mortar shell hit right on the other, right next to the dead horse. But the sergeant was still standing up, and I heard him say pill roller, and uh, I looked, and he was holding his left hand, and his left hand wrist had been severed, and with just white leaders and his hand hanging, hang, hang, hanging down there, and when I was looking, blood begins to squirt out from the uh, arteries, and why he didn't hit the ground when he told me to, when he said told me to hit the ground, I don't know why he didn't, but yes. anyway, there was happened to be. Uh, aid man pretty close by because I got up and I was going to try to find some put up a tourniquet and uh, the aid man uh, and that was my first comp in you know experience with combat that was about daylight it hadn't been day two hours when that happened when artillery was starting to fire around you you learned to listen to it and to okay. know which direction it was going how did you do that you can hear it when it's going to go fall it come short go over or come in don't ask me how i did it because it's beyond my car i, I don't know but you look you, you but did, you, you, you discovered got, how to god do that finally got where that you could tell where this coming in but after so many months there of, of combat i got where i was hitting the ground where it was coming in and fall short or go over artillery was the biggest it was artillery and tiger tanks was I mean, this thing that I had to, the, the that story I of the Battle of the Bulge is above all the story of American soldiers. I mean, this is this was really we talk about Custard's last stand. This was really uh, Hitler's mm-hmm. last stand that you guys, because of your bravery and what you did and your persistence, were able to hold them back. Well, the uh, I got there about the time that 
that we started retaking what the what the uh, Germans had broke through and overrun, and that's when when I came in and uh, I was re I was retaking you know places that they were occupying. Patton's Third Army provided relief to the north. The Second U.S. Armored Division stopped enemy tanks on Christmas and through January. American troops, often wading through deep snow drifts. Uh, attacked the sides of the shrinking bulge until they had restored the front and set the stage for the final drive to victory. Well, I can remember how the overcast, the star, the skies were, and everything, and the snow and all. And I finally, I remember when the when the sun finally broke through and their air force could move. That's when we really got when we really got relief and help. But the final thing I think that really uh, stopped n- not only our res- resistance is a as the Germans begin to run out of ta- out of oil, out of gasoline yeah. with the tanks, those Tiger tanks, we had nothing that would stand up against that. Yeah. Well, it's never again would Hitler be able to launch an offensive in the West on such a scale. Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill stated, this is undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war and will, I believe, be regarded as an ever-famous American victory. And you were part well, of that. Yes, I was. But the only thing I could remember what was in hearing distance or what, could, or what I could see, I didn't know what was going on anyplace else. And the uh, foot soldier, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know what was going on other than what we were actually involved in. Did you feel like you were going to make it back home? No, not until, not until really I had an experience with the Lord and I began to, the fear that, well, death was right there all the time, and anybody tell me that they weren't afraid? I was scared to death, son. I was—I had just turned—I was just turned in eight, uh, 19 years old. I'd never been away from home, never seen any death except a couple of old people that had died. Never seen any violence or anything like that, other than shooting, you know, uh, rabbits or squirrels or something of that nature. But here, all of a sudden, I'm right in the midst of all this atrocity that's going on. People, to, for somebody to say they weren't afraid, they got, they got to be lying. Yes, yes. I was scared to death. God bless you, James. My hands in the cold weather, mm. the, the gun was, it was, you couldn't touch the gun with bare hands. Your fingers would stick to the gun because of how cold it was. You wore your boots for several weeks without taking your boots off, right? I had I had eight six I had eight pair of socks. I had two on my feet, um, two or three pair around my waist, and a pair one under each arm to dry them. I'd rotate uh, with uh, you know dry socks coming out from under arm, put them under on uh, on my feet and the ones take them out, from, out of my, uh, put it around my waist, right. what have you, to dry them. Diane, you've taken men back to Pearl Harbor. You've taken them to Normandy. and Belgium. Belgium. Luxembourg, Germany, <laughs> Italy, England. We've been on uh, 54 trips. Has it been 54 in yes. the past 17 years? Yes. Oh, my goodness. It's a not. miracle. We've been to Normandy nine times. <laughs> And to Belgium nine times, and we're going to uh, Normandy for the 80th anniversary next year. Oh, my. Can you hold that book up? you got a book over there, and it's called Forever Young. Can you hold it up? So a little high, close to your face, because I want to make sure the people on that camera can see. <laughs> oh. But it's Forever Young Veterans, Stories of Sacrifice, Healing, and Hope. You and uh, Michael Ware wrote this book together, uh, and really COVID allowed you, gave you the opportunity to collaborate and write this book. Yes, uh, when the pandemic hit, we did not know what we were going to do with the veterans because a lot of them were living at home and they were alone. And we thought, gosh, we've got to do something to give them something to look forward to. See, that's the thing about the older veterans. If they have something to look forward to, it really changes their lives in many ways. So um, we thought, let's see if we can get their stories Uh, written down and let's do a book and it turned out to be wonderful because they were able to work with a writer we had a lot of different writers and they had someone that was working with them it gave them something to look forward to and i was very surprised how much this book has meant to them to have their stories in print 
Well, Mayor. also, Forever Young, I think it's worth noting, you guys have gotten national attention. I think yes. on one of your trips, one of the national news groups, was it ABC or one of them yes. traveled with you? David Muir traveled with us, ABC National News, for the 75th anniversary. And we had the CBS Morning News that was with us, a uh, morning show, that is, yeah. um, for the 80th of Pearl Harbor and then we've been on a lot of national shows like Huckabee and some others. And uh, Rush Limbaugh. Can you believe that I got to be on Rush Limbaugh? I'll tell you what. And, it, hey, it all started here because I <laughs> yeah. think I was one of your first media people to get on. Was I, we Probably. Not? 17 years ago when I first heard we got you on the air, we've helped launch a lot of people's careers. No, really. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that God has I'm, used you with. James, you got something? I would like to bring out one point that uh, I was married – 72 years, about a year and a half after my wife passed away, I did not realize how deep depressed I was. Here was this lady been with me. We've been together. She was just right with me. I'd never done anything she wasn't involved in. All of a sudden, you know, of course, it took a year for her to die, but here she was gone. I did not realize. I disposed of everything I had. Only thing I own now is an automobile uh, a computer and a telephone. I disposed of everything. But along about that time, I found out that by going to the meetings, the first meeting I went to with Diane was 12 people. This last meeting, there was well over 200. I would say closer to 300 people there. Now, uh, that's telling you something besides just taking me to see the world. Uh, I didn't realize I'm going to go back to where I was in depression. I didn't realize how bad I was. And um, Diane was going to Normandy. First, I was I was not going to go. I just I was out of it. Um, I deposed, disposed of everything I had and all. And um, anyway, my son, uh, my youngest son and his wife, they had never had a uh, um, honeymoon. So he said, Dad... Uh, I'll, we'll, Sonia and me will go with you if you'll go. And said, and we'll just use it as, I, as, our, as our honeymoon. And I said, well, okay, I decided to go. And I want you to know, son, that during that trip, I can use the word therapeutic. Listen, that lifted me. The outpouring of, of uh, uh, love, that's the only thing I, way I express it, of love, from people from all over the world there that was welcoming us there as liberators of Europe. And the, pic the, the pictures of the people wanting me to hold their babies and, and women, you know, in the French, of course, they're... <laughs> <laughs> Both cheeks. But Both cheeks, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that it lifted me out of that dark, depressed feeling that I had. Didn't cure me altogether, but brother, I'll tell you what, it lifted me. I came away from there a different, having a whole different attitude. I was ready to face life again and get my life back together, knowing that the Lord still had work for me to do. Yes. Even though Louise, who was my right hand, uh, she's like my right arm, uh, although she didn't help her. And when I was pastoring, she was a song leader. And she's the one that got me in the church in the beginning. But uh, it was that trip. And I've enjoyed each one since then. But that was like uh, just, I don't know, uh, no psychiatrist or anything <laughs> could have done for me. Even though I was a pastor, even though I was still preaching every Sunday and Wednesday and even Saturday nights. But I still was depressed. Well, you're human. And, and love that. does heal. Yes. Yeah. And going back, you know, I... I I think you might know, Diane, uh, back in the mid-90s, my family, we were missionaries on the island of Guam. Yeah. And the Asia Pacific was another area mm -hmm. in World War II that was, you know, highly, oh, yeah. you know, tactical yes. and yes. battles going on. And Guam being one of those. But one of the things I remember seeing, it was really a blessing. There was many times I would go out to a, a memorial site on the island, you know, where maybe a certain battle had taken place. And to see a, a veteran U.S. soldier standing there side by side with the Japanese soldier veteran mm -hmm. and embrace, I'm getting tears just because I can picture it right now, and them embracing each other after the war and knowing what each country had been through and how, but they had come together 
and and had shared that moment there, you know. That's healing for yes, them. Yes, yes. These are two enemies, you know, mm-hmm. at one time. But now they can't be enemies anymore. You know, the battle exactly. was over with. Yeah, amen. This has been great. And uh, how can people get a copy of your book, Forever Young, Diane? Well, it's on Amazon. Okay. So uh, you can go to foreveryoungvets.org forward slash book. That'll take you there. Or you can just look it up on Amazon. Okay. But uh, we would definitely appreciate it. One because Jim's book uh, story is in our book. So, yes. uh, okay. but also we are planning to go to Normandy for the 80th anniversary, and we are looking for Normandy vets or World War II veterans that have a deep desire to go there. I mean, this is the 80th. This is probably the last huge anniversary that they'll be able to go because I can't imagine these World War II veterans being able to go for the 85th. Right. But we are looking for sponsors. We're going to have to fly these guys first class. It's going to be very expensive. So we need people to help sponsor these veterans so that they can be comfortable while they're flying there overnight and They've sacrificed so much for us. I mean, they need us now. And I've never taken a salary, Byron. You know know that. that, This is a ministry for me. that I do this for my dad and my uncles who fought in World War II in Korea. Mm. I have such a love for them. And we just want to see healing take place in their lives. And we know that the Lord is with us. I can't even begin to tell you the stories. Before every trip, I pray, Lord, you Amen. give these men what they need. And we have a few women, but we honor the older veterans, so there's not a lot of women, but we do have some. And God knows what they need, what's deep inside their hearts. I don't. I mean, we can raise money and plan everything, but only the Lord can have these miracles take place that yes. we see. Yes. Can I just share quickly Please. one story? Yes. One story that happened to one of our Vietnam veterans, and these are the kinds of things that take place that we're just sitting there and just going, God, we know how much you love these men and women who have fought for our country. But we were going to the wall in D.C. He had nine friends on the wall. He's a Marine. He was at Quezon. So when we got there, he was nervous. He was a little upset and So he thought, I just want to calm myself. So he and a Marine friend decided they were going to walk the length of the wall just to calm themselves before they started doing the rubbing of the names. Well, as they were walking down, one of our volunteers stopped them just randomly and said, let me take your picture. So they turned, and she took their photo, and off they went. Well, after the trip, she sent me the photo, and she sent the photo to him and he called me and he said I want to tell you what happened he said I enlarged the photo and above his left shoulder was his ve- very best friend who was killed at Quezon now this was not just an acquaintance I had known this marine probably for four or five years every year he would call me or text me and say Today is Gary's birthday, or today is the day Gary died, every single year. And here, right above his shoulder, is Gary's name. Oh, my. And there are over 58,000 names on the wall. That How could that even be possible? <laughs> but see, God knew he needed this, and he stopped at the exact place where his name would be over his left shoulder. And we see things happen like that all the time. I can't plan that. <laughs> no. Only God no. can do yes. that. I mean, we have so we see things happen like this on every trip, and you just can't deny no. the power of God. How much He appreciates those who have mm. sacrificed. See, Jesus understands sacrifice, yes. and so He has a special love for our veterans. I'm just convinced of it. So we just see this over and over and over, and. And for every young veterans, our, our motto is honor, healing, and hope. We found that as we honor these veterans, it helps bring healing to their lives, and it gives them hope for the future. As you just saw with Jim talking about how it, he realized God's not finished with me yet. That's right. So honor, healing, and hope is just so important. Yes. And um, I could tell you a million stories, honestly. <laughs> I have so many more of those. It's unbelievable. It is so beautiful. One final thing for me, the camaraderie. 
being with these guys, the fellowship, guys that went through the same things you went through, suffered the same things you suffered. And I'm telling you, brother, it's words cannot describe what these trips are doing for guys like me. And I praise the Lord for it, and I pray for them every night when I lay down on my pillow to go to bed because of what they're doing. I know church. I know church is, is the essence, and the Bible says we are forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, even as we see the day approach. But this organization is just doing something that church does not do for guys like me. God bless you, and James. And I appreciate what I want to tell you how much I appreciate. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your sacrifice and love for our country and all you did for the protection and freedom that we share as Americans. Thank you so much, my dear well, thank you. friend and brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Diane, it's always, every thank time you, you come, <laughs> you, you bring gold to, with you every time you come. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having us. It's we, it's so important. We can just never forget the sacrifice for our great country. I know America's having some issues right now, but it's still the greatest country in the world. And our vets, they deserve our love and they need us. Yes. The root meaning of the word angel is messenger. This is an <laughs> angel. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, God, Thank you. I love you. God bless you both. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to say goodbye. But before we say one more thing, uh, the website, if folks want to know more information, if they want to contribute to the cause of getting this organized trip, Normandy, is it? Yes. Uh, it's foreveryoungvets.org. Okay. And the phone number is 901 299 Seven five one six. And for those of you who don't know, we do have a monthly meeting in the faith building at Germantown Baptist Church on the third Thursday of every month. Oh. Coffee and donuts from 10 to 10.30. Our meeting's only one hour, 10.30 to 11.30. It's just to show our veterans how grateful we are. We honor them. It's We love America. It's very patriotic. And I think that's one of the reasons it's grown so yeah. much. I mean, they're just beating the door down is because I think it's something that's missing in our country right now. Yes. And we have a lot of veterans. We probably have around 200 that are coming right now. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. We also have some great entertainment, and we refer to her as the little general. <laughs> <laughs> the little general. I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, Diane, for the sharing of this wonderful story. For every young, it's a great ministry, friends. Learn more about it, too. Go to the website. Help contribute to the cause of these men who have been so faithful to serve for our freedom. And we're going to have to say goodbye. <laughs> I hate to. we got more so we can share, but we're going to have to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us. I'm Byron Tyler, and we'll talk to you next time.